Welcome to another exciting week on Tomorrow Today, your science show on DW. This week with innovative solutions from medical technology to bioengineering. Let's check some of them out. Here's what's coming up. Immunity cream, vaccine in a tube. Dangerous mountain streams, steps to avoid devastation from mudslides. from bread to plastic, turning leftovers into biodegradable products. Well, most vaccinations are pretty routine. A little sting from the needle brings massive rewards. Freedom from diseases that used to ravage mankind. Smallpox has been effectively eradicated. You can easily protect yourself from diphtheria and tetanus, but vaccines are often difficult to produce and they're also expensive. That's a problem in poor countries and in remote areas. There's sometimes a shortage of people trained to administer injections safely. Well, German scientists are working on a simple solution. Vaccine in a cream you can just rub onto your skin. It looks just like ordinary skin cream, but scientists at the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research are looking at ways to vaccinate people without using needles. The cream they're developing could be the solution. We thought that an application that doesn't involve any type of pain would be ideal. And our effective ingredients, in this case vaccines, can be absorbed by intact skin. This has several advantages. There's some risk of infection connected with injecting vaccines, and it can hurt. Needles have to be sterile, and vaccines must be kept cool. The base for vaccination through the skin could be a powder. That could possibly be practical in remote areas where doctors aren't available. Some vaccines need to be administered more than once in order to provide proper protection against infection. And in Africa, for example, it's relatively difficult for people to come several times for their booster shots. The method is a long way from being ready for general use. Nevertheless, what the scientists at the Helmholtz Institute for Pharmaceutical Research have discovered is a sensation. A few years ago, researchers headed toward a breakthrough when they began investigating whether nanoparticles can penetrate human skin and damage the body. As many others did around the world, we came to the realization that nanoparticles are safe because it's been proven that the particles over 10 nanometers do not penetrate the skin. But the scientists were puzzled that the larger nanoparticles, several hundred nanometers in size, gathered around the roots of hair. They then tried to discover if a vaccine could be delivered to the body by way of these hair follicles. The nanoparticles are like a taxi, and a cargo of vaccine is packed in or spread on the surface of these particles. They then enter a person's body via their hair follicles and release the components of the vaccine. This works when the immediate area around hair is free of calloused skin that otherwise protects the body. The vaccine packaged in the nanoparticle slides down along the hair follicles and ends up under the skin. Researchers have yet to discover what happens then, but they do know that the nanoparticles dissolve after they've done their job. That's still a far cry from a skin cream vaccine, however. That's because the body doesn't recognize the vaccine immediately. It needs an adjuvant as well, just like injected vaccines do. In Braunschweig, they're working on developing adjuvants for cream vaccines that fit the nanoparticles and can be given with the vaccine. Up to now, aluminum chlorohydrate has been used, but that substance has been suspected of causing cancer. We're not using any aluminum chlorohydrate. We're using what are called cyclic dinucleotides. These are molecules that signal the presence of a threat. They wanted to find out if the signals would activate the body's immune system. They tested it first on human cells, which are in a red fluid here. 
Then the vaccine and adjuvant were tested together on mice. The researchers compared the treated human and mouse cells. The properties of the cells can be made visible using laser color marking. That allowed the team from the Helmholtz Center to demonstrate that the vaccine was effective and the nanoparticles had penetrated the skin. Full-scale clinical trials are needed to find out whether using creams to deliver vaccines is really feasible. Once these are completed, the method could be licensed for use. The conditions are different for humans, for immunological reasons among others. Yet seen in terms of tolerability, I think the carrier system's chances are good. The requirements have been met now, so it's time to make plans for a test flight. It's theoretically possible to use a cream for all vaccines. But doctors still need to determine safe doses because even though applying a cream looks easy, every vaccination is an intervention in the body's immune system. Well, the Nivelis Prize is the most prestigious scientific research award in Germany. One of this year's eight winners is Stefan Grimme, a chemist from the University of Bonn. He's won two and a half million euros to further his work in theoretical chemistry. He's been recognised for his creation of savvy computer programmes that model the structure and interaction of molecules. Well, the programmes are being used by chemists, biologists, material scientists and synthesis researchers all over the world. Stefan Grimme's field is theoretical chemistry. He develops computer programs to model the structure of complex molecules and represent them visually. This is a model of a small nanomotor, and we want to find out how the red part of this cluster separates out, what the mechanism is. The key is to use computer programs to model the laws of nature we've known for a long time, moving electrons and atoms in time. We know and understand these laws of nature, but they are very, very complex. What we want to do is translate all that into mathematics and then into a program so we can perform realistic simulations of these processes we can't actually see on the computer in a short amount of time. The computations are based on wave functions. Since electrons cannot be seen, Grimme studies them indirectly, modeling their behavior with the help of mathematics. The methods and models he's developed have become a standard and are used around the world. I like brainstorming and getting inspired by my colleagues. That always leads to something. I don't have a list of topics I want to work through. I'll carry on the same way. It's always proved successful, so why change it? Since 2011, Grimme has been director of the Mulliken Center for Theoretical Chemistry at the University of Bonn. He lectures four times a week. He doesn't just read his slides, he really explains things. He's really relaxed, and his teaching is informal, too. But when it comes to research, he's much more intense. He says he's impatient, and his colleagues confirm that. I'm not one to switch off. That has a good side. You pick up lots of ideas in unexpected places and at odd times, so it is productive. Of course, at some point you do have to switch off. You need a break sometimes. And it's no good if you can't sleep because an idea is going round and round in your head. So it has good aspects and bad. Even as a child, Grimme was fascinated by technology and took apart any device he came across to see how it worked. He got to know his wife, Gabi, at university. We met when we were students. That happens a lot. You work together closely in the chemistry lab, you help each other and discuss things. The lab is a typical place to get to know someone. Stefan and Gabi have a daughter and a son. Grimme plays darts with his son Paul every day and often loses. 
He really switches off when he's tending to his collection of cacti. I must have been about 10 when I got interested in a cactus. That's how it began. If you collect plants, it's interesting to watch them change. It also has something to do with chemistry. The key thing in chemistry is change. It is more interesting than having rocks on a shelf. They look nice, but they don't change. The more complex a structure, the more exciting it is for Grimme. To predict the movement of electrons in molecules, you need powerful computers. Theoretical pharmaceutical research, which deals with, say, 10,000 atoms or even more, that is our holy grail. If we were able to make accurate predictions at that level, that would be a major advance. Also in terms of applications, in developing medicines efficiently. But we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten beyond 1,000 atoms or even 500. As recipient of the prestigious Leibniz Prize, Stefan Grimme gets two and a half million euros to be devoted to further research. Well, mountain mudslides are often deadly and unpredictable. And due to global warming, spring rainfall in the mountains is getting heavier, increasing the risk of devastating mudslides that breach even thick concrete walls. Well, scientists in Vienna are trying to come up with ways to protect towns and villages from mudslides, or at least give some warning when pretty mountain streams turn into destructive torrents. The gently rippling waters of a mountain stream. But the streams are not always like this here in North Tyrol. They're regularly hit by mudslides, suddenly and without warning. Experts at the Institute of Mountain Risk Engineering in Vienna know how unpredictable mudslides can be. They're trying to find new measures to protect people from the dangers. Johannes Hubel and his colleague are testing out an idea, a simple net that's cheap and easy to install. But is it strong enough? The net does in fact break up the mudslide and holds large objects back. It could be used to make high-risk locations safer. If we didn't have barriers, we wouldn't be able to inhabit large parts of the Alps. The areas where mudslides deposit are exactly where these processes would take place. In the Lattenbach Valley region of North Tyrol, experts have tried using concrete walls to halt mudslides. But the concrete wasn't strong enough for the powerful avalanches and was simply washed away. Hubble shows how mudslides come about. Further upstream, the banks are made up of loose sand and gravel. They're easily dragged along by fast-flowing water. If large quantities are pulled into the water, it can trigger a mudslide. For a mudslide, you need small and large debris from the riverbank. The smaller pieces are all the things lying around here. The larger blocks come from above. We have mudslides every two or three years, so not much has to come down from up there for us to get large flows down here. Bad weather is the main cause of these flows. Heavy rainfall on the banks loosens the sand and small stones there, which then also allows larger rocks to tumble into the stream. The water then picks up more and more debris from the banks as it flows down into the valley, reaching speeds of between 50 and 100 kilometers an hour.
It all ends up downstream, where it meets the river Sana. The build-up of mud and rocks blocks up the river and causes floods in the area. You can't protect property, it's just about human lives. For that very purpose, Hubel's team has set up a 2D scanner, eight meters above the Lattenbach water. It sends out a laser which constantly checks the stream bed for mud flows. If it detects a mudslide, it sends out a warning which allows officials to block the bridge below and get people to safety. The screen shows a cross section of the stream. The red line indicates the mud flow. Hubel is always looking for simple solutions. His latest idea is to place an electric signal transmitter on this line. Concrete blocks are also hung on the line that crosses the stream. If there's a mudslide, the blocks are pulled away from the transmitter, and that sets off the alarm. It's a simple but effective way to warn people in the valley below about mudslides. The systems only give them a few minutes notice, but that could be enough to save lives. Fast. Well, every week, viewers send us in science questions that they've been wondering about. This week, a viewer in the Philippines wanted to know about one of the big breakthroughs in the world of physics, the Higgs boson. The elusive elementary particle was dubbed the God particle. It proves some of the main contentions of standard particle physics, which scientists use to understand the universe. Well, our resident genius, Einsteinchen, has more. Oh, oops, it's lazy. <laughs> oh. Hello. Nice to see you again. We've been receiving lots of exciting questions from our viewers. Hona Lidia Guillen from Lapu Lapu would like to know, is there really such a thing as a God particle? The answer is yes. Or at least, the Higgs boson particle exists. Maybe calling it a god particle is a little too strong. The particle is especially important to physicists to help them prove their model for understanding the Earth. For decades, it only existed in theories. Then, scientists built a huge underground ring to carry out experiments. Those tests prove that the Higgs boson particle exists. The discovery of the Higgs boson particle helped prove many scientific theories correct. It was so important that scientist Peter Higgs was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work. But the name God particle did not come from the scientific community. That name was coined by the author of a book about physics. The particle got the name because it helps scientists explain how the world works. If you have a question, write us by going to our website, DWDE Tomorrow Today. See you soon, and don't forget, the most important thing is to never stop asking questions. Well, that question deserves an Einsteinchen DVD. And if you'd like a chance to win one too, head to our website and send us in a science question of your own. Well, here in Germany, there are bakeries on almost every street and in every shopping centre, which throw out huge quantities of leftover bread at the end of each day. A viewer asked on Facebook if all that wasted food can be used somehow. Well, researchers at the Leibniz Institute for Agricultural Engineering have developed a method to turn it into plastic that can be used to make everything from surgical screws to shopping bags. Let's have a look at the process. Bakeries keep their shelves full right up until they close, so customers always have a choice. 
but that means lots of leftover bread. This is what's come back from one of our stores. Before, we used to be able to give it to farmers, but we can't do that anymore. Now it's all controlled, and that's creating a huge problem. Finding a solution for recycling food, or at least not just throwing it away, would be best for everyone. Bioengineer Joachim Venus and his team at the Leibniz Institute for Agricultural Engineering in Potsdam say that can be addressed by making plastic bags out of stale bread. Bread is suitable because it's made with grain and contains starch, which is made up of sugar, and those are exactly the substrates that our microorganisms like best. The leftover bread is ground up and mixed with water in a fermenter. This is where the bacteria get to work. It's all about classical metabolic processes. They convert the carbohydrates in the bread into lactic acid. It's not only bakery leftovers that get a second chance here. Here are a whole lot of materials that we can easily use for this process. You can see it already from the consistency. It could be grainy or liquid. We've got wood pulp, and these are remnants of coffee production. That shows how great diversity actually is in nature. It could be straw, algae, or wood. Many raw materials can be used to make bioplastics. Let's get back to bread. The crumbs have disappeared, and the first lactic acid has been synthesized. Millimeter-sized synthetic resin beads are used to filter what little solid remains in the murky liquid. These are remains of bread or impurities that the bacteria cannot digest. This process takes about two hours. The lactic acid is boiled down in the final step to ensure a pure concentrate is created. When we're finished with all these things at some point, then we have our final product, lactic acid. And when it's so clear and transparent, then that's just the right quality for making plastic. The Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Polymer Research then takes over to make the plastic. There, the liquid lactic acid is polymerized, meaning the individual molecules are structured into long chains. Starch fiber, or chalk, will later be added to provide more stability. After many hours, something that looks like plastic begins to appear. But it's hot. Temperatures are up to 200 degrees in the synthesizing reactor, and the bioplastic, known as polylactic acid, or PLA, is still soft. The PLA has to be granulated to prepare it for the next step in the process, and so we can handle it. The granulate can be converted into just about anything. Small PLA screws, for example, are used in oral surgery. They dissolve completely within the body. That property is also advantageous for the environment. A bag made from PLA breaks down and becomes part of the soil in just three months. That's a speed that conventional oil-based plastics can't match. You could wait forever. It does degrade, but it's not eaten or digested by microorganisms. They can't do anything with it. They can't get energy from it and build up biomass. They need something natural. Lactic acid is natural and can be utilized in natural cycles. In the end, it looks like this, a plastic wrap made from leftover bread. You can distinguish it from conventional plastic by its crinkly sound. We should strive to achieve closed cycles. We shouldn't use things up but find solutions that renew themselves and that we can use a century from now when all the oil's been used up. So today's fresh rolls could be wrapped in a bag made from yesterday's leftover bread. But it will be a few years yet before this technology is put to daily use. 
Well, if you'd like to find out more about making waste food into biodegradable plastics, check out our website, dw.de forward slash tomorrow today. And next week, we'll be looking at the waste plastic that's polluting the ocean in vast amounts. Even here in Germany, plastic that's been reduced to small shreds is present in lakes and streams. Sea creatures and fish eat those slivers of plastic, and that's how it ends up in the human food chain as well. We'll have that and more next week. But if you can't wait for your science fix, then you can always stop by our Facebook page or head for our website. There you'll find lots more on what's happening at the cutting edge of scientific research. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.